It's my great pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Sherry Johnson, uh, who's the Matthew V. Elliott uh, <coughs> Professor uh, at the University of California, Berkeley. And she's gonna be talking about emotion-related impulsivity, the search for neural and cognitive correlates. And of course, consistent with our um, theme, she's gonna be talking about dimensional relationships. And I'm gonna give a brief, uh, a brief introduction, and will not do justice to the, to the breadth, depth, and quality of her work. Uh, but I want to save time for her uh, to present. So her work has been funded by a number of agencies, including NARSAD, NIMH, NCI, and NS NSF. She's a fellow in a number of organizations, including the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies, the American Psychological Society, Academy of Behavioral Medicine and Research, and she was also recently president of the Society for Research in Psychopathology. Uh, one other interesting uh, note is that she has authored six books and has uh, well over 200 published articles. And I do want to save time for her, and I know that you all are getting a little bit hungry. So it's my great pleasure to introduce, introduce uh, Dr. Sherry Johnson. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Mary and Scott, for the chance to be here, for the lovely introduction, um, and thank you all for being here. Um, we've been talking a lot about positive emotions, and now in a kind of move that defies everything we know about what a speaker should do, I'm going to ask you to remember a horrible moment. I want you to think about a moment where you were maybe so angry that you said or did the wrong thing. And maybe even 30 seconds later, you kind of went, ah, oh, I can't believe I did it. That's kind of the phenomenon we're going to talk about today. But what I want you to imagine is that you're one of the people who has that experience of doing something in response to an emotion pretty much on a daily basis. And those are the people that I'm trying to understand a little bit more fully. So what I want to do today is I want to talk to you a little bit about definitions of emotion-related impulsivity. I want to show you a robust literature on how important it is to psychopathology. I want to raise some questions about directions for understanding the neurocognitive correlates. And then I want to tell you a little bit about some um, exciting new treatment possibilities. Just about everybody I know who studies impulsivity begins to hate the word, and the reason that I hate the word is that it's many different things, and they're not that well correlated with each other. And um, I'm only going to focus on one of those today. My work was heavily influenced by Whiteside and Lynham, who years ago took a set of the most um, commonly used measures uh, related to impulsivity, and did a large factor analysis where they showed that several factors really are relatively uncorrelated. So there are lack of premeditation, lack of perseverance, sensation seeking. And then the one we're gonna focus on is urgency or the tendency to act rashly during states of mostly negative emotion. Now that may wonder, make you wonder why I'm here this morning. Um, but soon after Don Lynham began to do his work, Siders came along and said, you know, clinically there's a group of people who also lose control during moments of good emotions, during very excited emotions. And maybe they drink more, maybe they eat more, um, but they do these things that later they really regret and say, that's not what I meant to do. And part of what's really interesting is that these two factors tend to be very, very highly correlated. So if you're a person who has problems in one area, you're highly likely to be a person who has problems in the other area. The scales are very simple and straightforward, 14-item scales that ask things like, when I'm upset, I often act without thinking, or when I'm very happy, I tend to do things that may cause problems in my life. These are easy to add to your studies, I will say that. Um, and what's nice is, uh, as much as we can criticize self-report scales, there are also parent and interview-based versions of these, and those are showing highly concordant effects. Now, very quickly after these scales came out, Don Lynham and his colleagues began to publish a lot of evidence replicating, validating these effects. Um, I actually had a grad student who made it his mission when he first arrived to say, I'm going to send you articles on these scales every morning. 
I was like, stop that. I don't want to wake up every morning feeling like I'm even more behind. Um, so um, what I love um, in this literature, though, is that people can take these scales and then show that in laboratory studies and ecological momentary assessment studies of day-to-day -day life, that they predict symptom worsening when people move into an emotion state. So whether you're doing mood inductions or you're studying natural variability in mood, people who have high scores on these scales tend to show their symptoms when they're in an emotion state. But what the heck is it? Um, that's been kind of the puzzle for me for about 10 years. Um, and when we first started working on this, we were really influenced by dual process models. Um, I don't need to belabor this with this group, but we were intrigued by the idea that all of us have modes of thinking that might um, relatively balance out towards reflexive versus reflective thinking. Um, I'm not, they're both on continuously. It's not like one is only operative at a time. And they also don't always conflict. You could have reflexive and reflective modes that point you towards the same behavior or decision. Um, and typically, most of us are operating in a more reflective mode. Um, but when that's perhaps not as powerful, maybe people are sleep deprived, maybe they're having other challenges, maybe due to individual differences. You can think of a person operating a little bit more on automatic pilot, um, a little less planful, a little bit more focused on habits, urges, emotion cues of the moment as the things that are guiding their behavior. Now, the reason that I was interested in this, though, is that that suggests a sort of more general top-down failure of constraint. And that failure of constraint you might expect to generalize to things like cognition and motivation. Um, and so we wanted to test that by creating item sets that weren't just about like these urgency scales, which are kind of behavioral responses to emotion states, but also how unconstrained are people in their motivation? Um, how unconstrained are their cognitions in the face of emotion? How broad is this kind of failure of constraint? And we reasoned that you might see um, a lot of correlation among those different issues of poor constraint. Um, so we asked items that were about not being able to control what happens when you're in a low motivation state. Um, we also asked items that were about whether your emotions kind of drive very extreme thoughts. And then we had control items that don't have anything to do with emotion. And what we found was a factor analysis that there really were two distinct factors that came through in relationship to emotion. So factor two is just the kind of no reference to emotion scale. Factor one, though, was about that negative emotions were driving thought and motivation. Um, factor three was largely these urgency scales that were about positive and negative emotion influencing behavior. So, so far, the groundwork would be that emotion-related impulsivity looks to be pretty distinct. You've got people who have this problem who don't otherwise seem to have problems with impulsivity. And I think important for today's talk, this problem in regulation is not distinct to positive or negative emotion. Those two tend to be really correlated. And that it might be a broader framework than just speech and behavior. There are people who are having also trouble constraining how emotion influences their motivation and thought. So with that, let's move to kind of thinking a little bit about what it means to have these problems and really a focus more on psychopathology. Oops. Um, that scale is pretty blurry, but what I want to say is there's a great um, meta-analysis of over 100 studies that suggests that negative urgency has higher effects on just about every facet of psychopathology people have studied than do other forms of impulsivity. When Berg did this meta-analysis, the same effect size was showing up in the early studies of positive urgency, and that has continued to kind of hit the map, that positive and negative urgency scales have more robust effects on psychopathology um, and similar effect sizes. Um, there's also now a large um, number of longitudinal studies that say that this predicts the onset and course of psychopathologies. 
And we were interested if this could help us with depression, which you wouldn't normally think about as being impulsive, but there were already a couple studies saying, hey, this is related to kind of levels of depressive symptom severity. So we wanted to take that on a little bit more fully and see if it could relate to, oh, actually there was even a large scale study of longitudinally that even positive urgency would predict increases in depressive symptoms. But could it help us understand fully diagnosable syndromes? Um, to do that, we recruited a group of people who had diagnoses of lifetime major depression, those who didn't, and we looked at whether they differed in these impulsivity scales, controlling for some of the comorbid alcohol problems that you sometimes see in depression. And what we found is that emotion-related impulsivity was elevated in our people with a history of major depressive disorder diagnosis. Um, and that we could see those effects sustained, although a little diminished, even if you controlled for current levels of depressive symptom severity using the Beck depression. People were reporting both kinds of emotion-related impulsivity, but there was a hint that the bigger problem they were having is that emotions were influencing their motivation and thought more profoundly. Rose Decker, uh, came to my team and replicated these findings. So this time with 60 people with a history of depression, 100 controls. We're seeing again that um, people with a history of depression are reporting particularly problems with this pervasive influence of feelings, the lack of constraint over how feelings and emotions influence thought and motivation. Those effects again are still holding when we control for current depressive symptoms. Now, you might say, yeah, but depression's so comorbid with all these things we know are part of impulsivity, alcohol, substance problems. So a couple times now we've done these kind of um, path models where we can really go in and control for different forms of comorbidity. And we're still seeing that pervasive influence of feelings is very specifically tied to depression. I think the bigger question we struggle with, though, is how does this help us understand the outcomes, the troubling outcomes that happen in depression? And one of the things that's really um, of concern in depression is self-harm. So Riley did a pretty beautiful study following over 1,100 women as they entered college to look at who developed self-harm. And urgency during those first weeks of college predicted the onset of self-harm during freshman year. It wasn't particularly the thing that differentiated who maintained it, but it had a pretty important effect on who started this behavior. And other impulsivity scores weren't telling the story. Here's um, a Casson study longitudinally looking at um, kids from age 10 through 25. Urgency scores are higher at every time interval for people who made suicide attempts. We um, have used our own scales to try and understand more about suicidality, taking the kind of ideation to action model to heart. And what we saw is that our pervasive influence of feeling scale was very tied to ideation, um, but it was the feelings trigger action scale that was related to suicide attempts. And in both cases, controlling for a host of other kinds of impulsivity and clinical syndromes. This kind of impulsivity though, emotion-related impulsivity, seems to be helpful in understanding both the ideation and the attempts, with slightly different forms of emotion-related impulsivity. My home base was bipolar disorder, and bipolar disorder seems like almost exactly where you'd want to study this. Um, so bipolar disorder, most of you will know, is defined by at least a single lifetime episode of mania. Um, and one of the things we've tried to do is when we recruit people, we recruit in a variety of symptom states, but then we follow them for months, sometimes a year, till they get to a well state for a couple months. So we're capturing them in between episodes. Um, the other thing we've done um, that's a little distinct is we try and understanding that most people with bipolar disorder go through periods of other kinds of syndromes. We try and balance that in our control group. So we're over recruiting for people who have anxiety disorders and substance use to say, what's the specific role of mania above and beyond that comorbidity? Um, so we waited till people were remitted. We gave them a host of impulsivity scales and we asked them to tell us about what they were like during this remitted period. 
standardize the scores so we could look at them comparatively. And what we found is that our folks with bipolar disorder were saying, yeah, I have problems with a lot of different forms of impulsivity, but they were significantly higher on the emotion-related impulsivity, the urgency and negative urgency scores, than they were on other forms of impulsivity. Now, um, you could say maybe that's just because they've been through many and it changes their self-views. We've seen this in at-risk studies as well now across a couple studies. Um, so that makes us again wonder, okay, does it help us with outcomes? Uh, with Sarah Victor, we looked at people who were remitted to see if this influenced the quality of life in bipolar disorder, their functional levels. Um, and we found that positive urgency related to lower quality of life, lower functioning levels, and we could see that controlling for any other form of impulsivity. We could control for medication, subsyndromal symptoms, comorbidity, history. We could, this just kind of pops out as more of driving force statistically. And again, we've been able to replicate those findings. Now, I also want to talk a little bit about anger and aggression. Um, I'm always nervous that this is going to get um, misinterpreted, so I'm going to try and say things carefully. But people with bipolar disorder have more than a fourfold increased rate of violent conviction, um, more than an eightfold increase in the odds that they will say they've threatened somebody with a gun, and more than a 16-fold increase in the rate of them saying, I've had a physical fight in the past year compared to the general population when we look at the epidemiological data. So I think if you're looking for a target that's gonna make a difference in somebody's life, this is a, a really important target for us to understand. But very carefully, I wanna explain, anger is also a cardinal symptom. It's a defining symptom of the manic episode and if we treat the mania, a lot of this comes way down and overall rates of aggression are within normal limits. But we still have a set of people who say, you know what, I'm still struggling. I still am having more problems with anger and aggression than other people are. And so we wanted to see if this type of impulsivity could help explain that problem um, of the persistence of anger and aggression for some people after remission. So same kind of design, we're recruiting people and following them till remission. And we asked our question again about positive urgency because it'd almost be obvious to look at negative urgency. If you're losing control during a negative emotion state, yes, of course, you'd expect anger and aggression. But what about the people who say, I can't control things when I'm in a good mood? And there we saw that that helped us understand who was having sustained problems with aggression and anger. Suicidality is another huge problem in bipolar disorder. About a quarter of people worldwide with bipolar one disorder report they've made a suicide attempt. About half say they've thought about suicide in the past year. A um, couple cohort studies out there saying that it's among the highest rates of suicidality across psychiatric conditions. It's a big problem and we need to do better in our understanding to guide better treatment. But so far in a really lovely meta-analysis, 13 studies, impulsivity wasn't helping us understand suicidality and bipolar disorder, but people were using non-emotion related impulsivity. So we wanted to use our you know, favorite strand of impulsivity. Um, and what we found is that positive and negative urgency were related to greater severity of suicidal ideation, more self-harm attempts during the lifetime, and greater odds of a suicide attempt. Largely similar effect sizes for positive and negative urgency, except negative urgency was more tied to ideation severity. So, hopefully I've convinced you that it's an important phenomenon, that it's more important for psychopathology than other kinds of impulsivity seem to be. It's coming up in cross-sectional and longitudinal work also with mood disorders and with understanding these outcomes in mood disorders. We can see in our PATH models that it's not likely to be explained by comorbid conditions. Um, we get a little differential um, outcomes from understanding kind of poor constraint over um, thoughts and motivation compared to poor constraint over speech and behavior. But the phenomenon seems to be there, it seems important, but what the heck is it is how I wanted to kind of um, still figure out, like, what do we have here? And there have been a lot of different models of what might be going awry for people like this, and part of the reason I'm here today is I'd like 
more biological scientists to take on this puzzle, because I think it's a really important one for us to understand psychopathology. So a couple of the different models here, let's just look at some of this evidence of kind of basic neurocognitive correlates. Um, this is Sarah Hughes, a Berkeley student winning the Olympics. We have a film clip of it that's been validated to make people at Berkeley very excited. So we showed it to our undergraduates. Um, and we measured positive urgency to see, is this all just about people being more emotional? Uh, we looked at a lot of different channels for assessing emotion, kind of classic study. We asked them how they felt, we looked at their psychophys, we coded their faces. Um, it turns out that no, our positively urgent folks were just more emotional, no matter which channel we looked at. Um, and I've been relieved to see lots and lots of other null findings. Um, whether you look at subjective reports, facial behavior, psychophys, all kinds of triggers for emotion, it does not look like these folks are just having more intense emotion. Something's going awry for the same level of emotionality. So it doesn't seem to be emotion generation. Um, now, I will say that the scanner seems to give us a little bit of um, interesting kind of maybe a little bit more exquisite sensitivity and what you see in paradigms that have put people in the scanner and exposed them to passive um, sensory observation of valence stimuli, you do see some differences in the profile of OFC activation as correlated with negative urgency. Looks like positive urgency, no, so maybe it's easier to get kind of valence stimuli to work for the negative channels. This is an example from Cider's study in the healthy community where she's seeing um, in the viewing of valence stimuli a little bit more right lateral OFC, a little more left amygdala correlated with um, urgency scores. So maybe the scanner will give us a lead on emotion. Risky decision-making has been a disaster behaviorally, neurally. I could show you lots of null results. You guys want lunch. I'm going to skip that. Um, what about response inhibition? This is maybe our go-to as, as a way of thinking about constraint. It's central in a lot of models of dual process and impulsivity. And what's interesting to us on this one is that Kevin Oxner's work shows pretty powerfully that reappraisal rests on some of the same circuitry, this kind of cognitive control network. Um, we did a meta-analysis, and something that happens that's a little interesting here, which is that if you look at the mean effect sizes in student or community samples, there's not much going on. There's more going on when you get into clinical um, samples, and I think that has to do with a restriction of range, that if you want to see a problem in executive function in response inhibition, you've got to get to the folks who are pretty severely impaired along this. Um, that also suggests that maybe it's curvilinear, that you don't see the effects until we get to kind of a more extreme level. So in two studies, we've modeled the curvilinear effect, even in undergraduates, and we can see that, that the decay starts to happen among the people who have the more serious problems with urgency. Um, in both studies, we also looked at response inhibition, though, after a mood induction, so that might have helped us. And what's interesting and when we've been doing these studies of executive function in the lab, response inhibition in the lab, is we can show that um, it looks impaired after you do a good mood induction and after you do a bad mood induction. So you make people either very happy or very unhappy, and you see this kind of problem in response inhibition. Now, that makes me think a little bit about something called the affective circumplex, about what's the same across those two kinds of emotions. And if you think about enthusiasm or fear, they're both high arousal states. And so it makes you wonder if the whole thing is really more about arousal than, say, emotion specifically. And that makes sense with some of the early literature on norepinephrine influencing cognitive performance, that, that a little arousal is a good thing, um, but as you get too much arousal, you begin to see some decay. And we thought that maybe what was happening is these folks are more vulnerable to the decay starting earlier, um, that it would take less arousal to set off the decay. So to look at that with Jen Perlstein, we use the anti task as a measure of response inhibition, and we use pupil as our measure of arousal, because then we could get in and look at trial by trial what was happening. 
Um, and what we found is that for people who were low on impulsivity, arousal was great. It really bolstered their performance, a little bit more arousal, and they did better on the next trial. But for our folks that had high levels of impulsivity, a little bit of arousal, even the kind of subtle shift we're seeing trial by trial in a boring lab task, was enough to pick up on a decay. So just for the people who had higher problems in this form of impulsivity, arousal was predicting poor response inhibition performance. We don't see that for any other forms of impulsivity, and we can replicate it across multiple um, scales that have been used to study emotion-related impulsivity as being there. Now, response inhibition looks pretty unique. Yeah, this is uh, out of like 80 studies of different measures of impulsivity, different measures of exec function. Most of them are getting null results unless they're studying response inhibition. So something going on there with response inhibition. Um, I've mentioned response inhibition um, rests on this kind of cognitive control network. Um, and so that gives us a window into looking at this in imaging studies. Um, and indeed, um, the first study that looked at this uh, that, that I want to highlight was null results. But they didn't do anything to look at valence stimuli or pushing kind of emotion in this. And so um, Chester, in contrast, looked at urgency and the recruitment of cognitive control, and he saw that it was related, but only when he used the negative stimuli during the cognitive control task. So it looks like you have to kind of push that emotion piece a little bit to get the effects. Um, and in fact, um, Turvo Clem showed that if you manipulated reward, then you got greater activation of supplemental eye field during an antipsychotic task for people with higher positive urgency. So pushing the system either positive or negative, we seem to see some differences in response to cognitive control tasks. Um, which um, is a little different in looking at late stage um, ability to kind of stop an action that's already begun using the stop signal task. Um, and they're seeing that higher levels of urgency are related to lower ability to activate the cognitive control network. So maybe it has a little to do with late versus early response inhibition. Um, but certainly three studies that managed to kind of use valence stimuli show that um, there are differences in the cognitive control network related to urgency. There are a couple studies out there resting state from connectivity, so, and those are showing uh, weaker connectivity across frontal lobe regions. Um, and we also have one, uh, three studies that show some uh, weaker links between default mode network and regions involved in cognitive and motor control. So connect may be a hopeful um, approach to understanding this a little bit better. And there are a couple structural studies, and generally those show um, decreased volume um, in regions involved in response inhibition and executive function, decreased volumes in regions involved in emotion generation and valuation. So it may be a collection of these kinds of processes are involved. So, so far what I think we have a little bit of a lead on is that there's something about response inhibition deficits, but it takes looking at the folks who have more severe problems. Um, it takes looking at this with attention to emotion and arousal. But I do want to say that the effects are relatively small. And some of that may just have to do with the level of error variance we have in cognitive tasks. Some of it may have to do with that there's probably multiple processes involved. There may be processes I haven't even highlighted here. So Chase with Mary Phillips recently showed that urgency was tied to differential responding to um, uh, reward. Um, in kind of key nodes within the reward network. So um, it's still, I think, a hunt to kind of identify exactly a kind of fuller biological model of what's happening for these people. But I'm going to focus in a little bit um, on what we think we've seen so far, which is that two leads seem to be response inhibition and hyperarousal. And, and we've been asking the question, well, if that's on target at all, can we treat those and see a difference? Um, so with Andrew Pem, um, we wanted to look at 
cognitive training. Could you just train response inhibition? And he also was interested in um, the interface with working memory capacity for kind of holding your goals in mind. Um, and would that make a difference? Um, and so we recruit transdiagnostically. If, if somebody had high scores on feelings trigger action, we enrolled them. Um, we assigned them to wait list or to immediate treatment, and treatment was really brief, just six 30-minute computerized training sessions. And then we looked at how they were on emotion-related impulsivity after training and at two-week follow-up. Wait list, we didn't see any changes. That's good. We were happy with that. Um, but we saw a moderate or moderate to large effect size of this simple cognitive training on, a, on improving their emotion-related impulsivity or their feelings trigger action score. Um, so it looked good at posting and continued to look better even at follow-up. Um, so this is one where I had to swallow my words as advisor because I'd been telling him for about two years, don't do a cognitive training study, it's not going to work. And Andrew's now off testing this in a day hospital with a more impaired population. I also thought, can we use cognitive behavioral treatment? Um, and to do that, we began to wonder about looking at aggression. And the reason for that is that emotion-related impulsivity is a profound predictor of aggression problems across many different um, community and clinical samples at this point. Aggression is also a remarkably clear, crisp behavioral outcome. So it's easily measured. Um, Guggenheim gave us money to create an intervention for people who had high levels of emotion-related impulsivity and were showing aggression at least once a week. And our idea here was that if, listen, if you're one of these folks and the minute you're in a state of high emotion, your PFC is not working that well and you're feeling fuzzy brain, then a lot of the things we do as cognitive behavioral therapists may not work very well because we do a whole lot of, can you contemplate that? Can you take a different perspective? Can you think about it differently? And we thought, that's going to be trash. It's not going to work. So we wanted to avoid that, um, which meant that we took very simple behavioral strategies. And one of the first things we thought is, well, let's put in a module that's about just explaining this idea of you may only be impulsive during moments of high arousal. I was shocked at how well that worked. In this first set of people, I saw folks individually before we put it online. Um, and the first woman I explained this to said, can I give you a hug? And I was like, um, why? And she said, well, I've been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And, you know, that made sense. But then I went back like a year later, and they said, well, I think what you also have is anxiety and, and trauma. And she said, well, and that makes sense. Um, but then I went back a year later, and they said, well, you know, now you're in a depression. And she said, well, that makes sense. But I keep going back and saying, what else you got for me? <laughs> And she said, this is what I have. It doesn't really matter what the emotion state is. It's that the emotion state gets me in trouble. Um, so once we've kind of given them that, and I think part of the reason that's a relief for people is there's a kind of aha moment of like, I don't have to worry about every moment in my life. I have to worry about these moments. And, and then there's relief that we can learn skills for these moments. And those skills are basically helping people be more aware of high arousal moments and their triggers really rehearsing strategies for calming, um, and then using daily monitoring to make sure that they're gathering data on how those strategies work and implementing them well. And then we get personalized feedback out of those logs, and then we have them pre-plan what was the thing that was for you, using something called implementation intentions, which is basically saying, if you're in a state of high arousal, whatever your word is for that, what's the one thing that you're gonna be your go-to simple strategy? All of this is so straight ahead and so behavioral that it made me start to feel like I was being a radio psychologist, giving people like the crispest stuff, but we were determined to see how easy we could make it. Um, what was a little more novel is that we decided we're gonna give it online and we're gonna foster implementation in their daily life using kind of uh, experience sampling software to ping them four times a day, get them to monitor their mood, get them to, add, to think about what coping they've used and how well it's going for them. So lots of kind of can we do this in a more automated fashion. Um, 
we ended up recruiting 212 people by mistake. We were funded for 100, and it went viral. Note to self about online programs. They do kind of end up recruiting people. We also were a little surprised by who enrolled. I thought it would be the kind of um, undergraduates who get a little frustrated. It wasn't. We had people, 12% of our people had had legal problems from their aggression, and they were reporting a mean of 51 incidents of aggression in the past three months that our observers judged to be significant and severe. And um, having done some of these interviews, I can tell you that for a few days I was nervous to walk into Walgreens. Um, because people were really talking about periods of discontrol in their daily life that were a little shocking. Um, so we didn't see a change from pre-waitlist to pre-treatment, uh, which is, again, good. Our waitlist um, condition was not where the action was, but we saw substantive drops, whether we asked people about interview, uh, whether we did our interview scales, um, or we asked about their self-report. We saw substantive drops in aggression. Those were sustained through our kind of three-month follow-up after treatment ended. Um, and we could see similar effect sizes for physical aggression, verbal aggression. One that surprised us is we saw similar effects for self-harm, so aggression towards self. Um, which has now spun into, we're developing variants of this to our counseling center on kind of self-harm and suicide, and at the same time hoping to take this into juvenile justice system in San Francisco for highly aggressive adolescents. So, uh, what's my punchline here? Um, I'm hoping that many of you will be intrigued to look at of impulsivity because I think we don't fully have the biological answers, but what we do have some, is some clues about where to look. And what I would say those clues are is that we should be thinking about positive and negative emotions in parallel. Um, the reason I'd love to see more people working on this is that it's important not just for externalizing, but for mood disorders and for understanding key outcomes in mood disorders. Our hints so far are to kind of look at response inhibition during states of high arousal. Um, and one reason that I have confidence that that might be kind of part of the general spot to look is that when we've targeted those in intervention, we're seeing nice drop on not just impulsivity, but in the aggressive behaviors and self-harm behaviors that are so tied to those. Um, I want to give thanks to a huge team that's been incredible with these puzzles, and I think we have time for questions. Thank you. So, yes, indeed, we have time, I think, for one or two quick questions. Yes. Yes, very interesting talk. I do a lot of work in urgency as well. And um, I uh, wanted to ask about whether you've, you're talking about arousal. Have you looked at physiological measures, uh, for instance, conductance or heart rate variability or things like that? We have. We've done a number of studies on that. So we don't see them having higher skin conductance or um, differences in, say, HRV. Um, in response to emotion stimuli. So they don't look like they're more aroused. We looked at both skin conductance and pupil dilation indices of arousal um, in predicting decays in um, the um, response inhibition performance across trials. And we only saw effects for pupil. Pupils, of course, innervated by um, norepinephrine. It's a nice measure of that. But it also has a little bit of an advantage in terms of time scale. We're not entirely sure if that's the specificity of the kind of channel we're getting at there versus the time scale. Um, we're replicating that now and um, looking at a slightly different design to kind of parse timing and um, different indices of arousal. So stay tuned. Ask me in a year. I um, have time for just one more question because of lunch. So. Uh, I just wondered, so much of your data is totally relatable to borderline personality disorder and whether you had considered that because it just fits? It does fit very well. There's a correlation of about 0.65 between measures of severity of borderline and this. What I find fascinating is we can control for the borderline symptoms and still see these robust effects on many, many other diagnostic outcomes. So recently we wrote a paper sort of talking about how we would view this from a kind of p-factor transdiagnostic lens, and we're doing more modeling transdiagnostically, but you're totally on target that a lot of the, this does a very clean job of explaining many of the problems you see in borderline personality disorder. And your, your treatment also follows a lot of DBT. Yes, it does. It's just a lot 
simpler. We're not, mm -hmm. you know, Linehan uses about 100 techniques. We're using mm -hmm. about three, offering them online, um, and it's quick. It's about six weeks. Thank but, you. Yeah, absolutely. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you very much to Sherry for a fascinating talk. Thank you.